tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's not meant to be taken at high speeds and we just need everybody to slow down. Drivers urged to slow down with more crashes on critical supply routes for truckers. Also, this lake looks like a war zone. The destruction at Cultus Lake and why locals are crossing their fingers and why the city of Vancouver is an outlier as it increases taxes. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There's increased urgency tonight asking drivers to be careful on the most critical supply route for truckers right now. Rough roads, winter conditions and impatient drivers have meant a higher number of bad crashes on Highway 3 with the Coquihalla still closed. And as Joel Ballard tells us, it has many calling for calm. A stream of semi-trucks merging onto Highway 3 just outside of Hope. They're forced to use this unfamiliar route after flooding took out the Coquihalla. Uh, snowy, poor visibility. It's very, very, very busy. There is a lot of accidents out there right now. Highway 3 is the main supply chain artery between the Lower Mainland, the Interior and the rest of Canada, leading to more traffic than ever before. Be very cautious and have respect for that highway. Uh, it, it is unforgiving in places, and it is Im absolutely imperative you follow the, the, the road signs. So unforgiving that there have been many accidents in the last month, including three deaths. It's a two-lane road, winding and climbing over mountain passes with multiple switchbacks. Very rough terrain, like in winter months, be prepared even as a long-distance driver. I know I'm prepared for the worst, but something like... That, that'll kill you faster than the Coke will. But safety isn't always top of mind. You get some of these very heavy trucks that are taking their time going down the hill, and you get people that are impatient behind them, they can't wait, and they start doing stupid things up there. Like crossing double lines. And it's not just the police warning people to slow down and be careful. Local communities along the highway are also frustrated. I understand there's deadlines to be met, but this highway is, it's not meant to be taken at high speeds, and we just need everybody to slow down, take your time. All these concerns, and the highway is only actually open for essential travel. Right now, the RCMP and CBSE have set up checkpoints just outside of Hope and Princeton along Highway 3 to ensure that the highway is only being used for essential travel. Think the transport of goods and supplies, or evacuation orders, or even emergency responses. What it doesn't include, however, is a ski weekend away. And if you don't meet the bar, you'll be turned around. As for how long this will all last, crews are working tirelessly to get the Coquihalla up and running again. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Hope. And parts of Cultus Lake Provincial Park are unrecognizable because of those historic floods. The popular Fraser Valley Park was hit hard by multiple storms over the last few weeks. Scenes of fallen trees, pathways washed away, and campgrounds buried under hard debris now greet visitors. Streams now carve through areas leading to the Maple Bay side of the lake. What I'm standing in here right now is like a picnic campground area that's just covered in, in like four feet of dirt and, and it's just eerie. This lake just looks, it it's, looks like a war zone. Like. Caldus Lake isn't the only provincial park reeling from the floods. Sasquatch, Skagit Valley and E.C. Manning provincial parks have been hit too. And according to the province, there may be even more. Now, the scale of the destruction and the uncertainty is overwhelming. And now farmers in the Fraser Valley are calling on the province to do a lot more to help in the aftermath of the floods as well. Janella Hamilton reports tonight on the emotional and financial holes they're facing. You know, we got flooded. But when you come back to your house and you see that your door's been kicked in, you've been robbed. It's almost too much for Ryan Sandu. For weeks, the Abbotsford farmer and his family have been out of his childhood home after the property was covered with six feet of water. The house is destroyed. Then they were robbed. Every Father's Day, they get me you know, watches. They took them. They took my, um, my mom's jewelry that she had it down. Um, 
Yeah, they took a, they took, they took a lot of sentimental stuff. He's worried for his father, who built the house with his bare hands in the late 70s. We haven't brought him back to that property here. It's, uh, it'll be too much for him to see. The loss of their livelihood is overwhelming. This is where we uh, do our propagation to get the plants ready to, to uh, plant outside and all that stuff. So we have to get this ready before February to be able to start farming again. And his family wants more government help as the clock continues to tick. They just came and put a sticker on the outside of our door and said shouldn't be entered in, but they haven't offered any guidance on what to do, how to do it. Sandu says the province has offered 300000 in compensation, but he thinks that will barely make a dent. Like we've got tiles that are cracked, now we have to rip the whole tile out and it, it's a lot of work. It's, it's, it's not something that you can just put a number and say, here, this is all we're going to give you. The mayor of Abbotsford is also worried about the future of agriculture. We know the blueberry farmers uh, also will be uh, revenue short for maybe four years if all those plants have to come out. So that is a concern to me and uh, I will be, I actually have raised this already with senior levels of governments. Despite the devastation, the Sandus are determined to rebuild their home and their memories. We have to um, get ourselves together and do what we can do and get back on our feet. He wants a guarantee such a disaster will never happen again with better dike reinforcement and other flood mitigation measures. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Abbotsford. Well, a stubborn barge beached on English Bay isn't going anywhere anytime soon, even with all the commotion today. A crane and tugboats were seen on site today, prompting speculation that the unwanted West End guest could be pulling up anchor. But according to the city, the timing for removal is still to be determined. Meanwhile, work has started by the owner to assess any damage and make repairs ahead of the next removal attempt. And if you're planning to head up to Mount Seymour this winter, you'll now need a pass. The mountain pass will be required for drivers using the public parking lot from December 15th. The permit is free of charge and is available on the BC Parks website. Those with a valid ski hill pass to Mount Seymour Resort do not need to get one. The province says this is all part of a pilot program brought in to limit crowding at the top of the mountain. Given limited cell service on the mountain, visitors will need to print the passes or download a copy before driving out. And Johanna Wagstaff is here now for a look at what's to come. And Joe, uh, that includes this special weather statement, but it seems, mm -hmm. like we, it seems like we just went through this. Oh, I know. At least, Anita, we've had, you know, a week or so since a, a, a major rain event, but we do have rain coming this weekend for the South Coast and Environment Canada just a couple of hours ago issuing a special weather statement. This is for a Friday into Saturday storm. I know it was lovely to see the sun today and we'll get more tomorrow, but let me show you where we're at as far as the next one. And this is not an atmospheric river. So while we will see snow levels down around 500 to 1,000 meters. We should be able to hone in on that height uh, over the next 24 hours. Uh, it is mainly a rain story for the south coast uh, for Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley. 40 to 80 millimeters Friday through Saturday. Also looking at some pretty good wind gusts, 60 to 80 kilometers per hour. And then for the mountain passes, for our locals and you know even some areas above, up above 500 meters, 15 to 25 centimeters. So a significant storm sliding down our northwest coast. So coming at us from a very very different location than uh, our atmospheric rivers, uh, which is why we will get a bit of the uh, mountain snow. So taking you through the next 24 hours, there's a chance of seeing uh, some morning showers. I know it was lovely to get a blue sky day today. Here's a snapshot tomorrow, 10 a.m. Notice there is some light snow out towards the Fraser Canyon mountain passes. Clearing out, though, through the afternoon, I think we'll see some sunny breaks, but I've got to keep the risk of a stray shower in there for tomorrow. And Anita, it's also a little chillier, those northwesterly winds that were howling this morning, bringing temperatures down. So you and everyone else, but definitely you, add a couple extra layers for tomorrow. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> feeling it for sure, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. A Saanich High School student hit by a vehicle in a marked crosswalk on Monday has died. 16-year-old Cadence Burke was hit while crossing Cedar Hill Crossroad at Merriman Drive shortly before 10 p.m. He was just steps from his home. He was taken to Victoria General Hospital with life-threatening injuries but later died. 
The driver of the vehicle is cooperating with the investigation. And a man in Vancouver has been hurt after an accident involving an SUV and a scooter. It happened around 2 p.m. today at the intersection of Camby Street and Dunsmere. Firefighters quickly responded and gave first aid to the man. A white SUV with front end damage did stay on scene. And Vancouver police say the man's injuries are potentially serious and the intersection will be closed for the time being. They say they don't yet know the chain of events that led to the collision. And a woman has died and a man rushed to hospital badly hurt after two pedestrians were hit by a vehicle last night in Mission. It happened just after 6 o'clock on Lougheed Highway, east of Highway 11. Police say the woman died at the scene. Speed, alcohol and drugs are not believed to be factors in the crash. Mounties say the driver is cooperating with investigators. A provincial cabinet minister is recovering from minor injuries after being knocked down on her way home from the legislature yesterday. Katrine Conroy is MLA from Kootenai West and the Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. A police report has been filed with anyone with information is asked to contact Victoria Police. Premier Horgan saying online he was very upset about the news. BC Seniors Advocate says there's been a big rise in abuse and neglect on older adults in this province. Her data shows abuse has climbed 49% over the past three years. Over a slightly longer period, RCMP are reporting a nearly 70% increase in violent crime inflicted on seniors. And the VPD, a 49% rise in reports of financial abuses. The seniors advocate says abuse can take many forms, from financial to physical, but also psychological, such as intimidation and humiliation, as well as legal, like taking advantage of the trust built on family relationships. Some forms of neglect can be the result of the best of intentions, but reflect the inability of someone to care for their loved one or for someone to care for themselves. Regardless of why, the neglect results in often irreparable physical harm to the senior, such as severe infections, loss of mobility, the development of any host of illnesses, and often premature placement in long-term care. She says the rising numbers are not the only reason for concern, but also the lack of a centralized support line to report problems. The main reason abuse isn't reported, she says, is that people don't know who to call and where to get help. People living in Vancouver, perhaps a little shocked today as they're going to be hit with a higher upcoming tax bill. Now, they were warned there would be a decently sized tax increase, but what's come from council passing its 2022 budget last night, well, it's a lot more than expected. Justin McElroy is here to break it all down. Justin, how big are we talking? Yeah, a $1.7 billion budget for the city of Vancouver. For weeks and months, the city was saying they were hoping to keep it to a 5% property tax increase or less, and it ended up being 6.35%. And if you're thinking that's higher than it's been in the past in Vancouver, you're right. If you take a look at this graph over the past decade, average property tax increases in the city have gone up from about 2% in the first half of last decade to going up to 5, 6, 7% two years ago and now 6.35% this year. And at least this year, compared to other cities in BC, major municipalities that have either passed their budget or put forward their proposal, it's the highest of any of them. So certainly, if you're the city, if your councillor is saying that there's a lot of different initiatives they want to fund, you're happy with it. This is why it passed at the end of the day, six to five. But if you're just looking at the sticker shock, you know, it's a $200 increase just under that for the average detached home. It's just under a $100 increase for the average condo, but it's certainly more than people will have seen in previous years. Okay, and let's talk a little bit more about all of those things, those extra initiatives that can happen with these funds. What are they? Yeah, so the reason that the increase went from 5% to 6.35% is that over the course of budget day, a lot of councillors had a lot of different amendments to put extra money towards things that weren't in the draft budget. And the biggest ones there, if you take a look at this chart, were number one in policing, both in terms of getting what the VPD wanted so they could fill vacancies, but also arbitration settlements that have increased salaries for officers, as well as $9 million for climate change infrastructure, things like EV charging, bike lanes, 
things, better pedestrian uh, ramps, $3 million for fire and rescue services, more officers, particularly in the southeast part of the city, and a few miscellaneous items for different programs throughout the city. But it's that $20 million for policing that is the biggest. Policing is the biggest part of the city's budget, and not every councillor was on board with that increase. We need to use that those extra millions to pr provide safety for everybody, not just for some people, not just for the ones that own property. Of course, any time that you raise taxes this much, there's going to be some division from the general public. Of course, Justin McElroy, thanks so much. Thanks, Anita. Well, more auto mechanics are now being trained to work on electric vehicles with a new program setting on Vancouver Island. With over 60,000 EVs on BC roads, British Columbians are making the switch to EVs in record numbers, and we will continue to encourage that switch by breaking down the perceived barriers that people have around EVs. There are plenty of traditional combustion engine mechanics out there, but this program will help train a new breed. The program is being piloted as two one-week in-person courses at Camosun College's interurban campus in Greater Victoria. The expansion of EV maintenance training comes from the Clean BC Go Electric program. The program is currently offered regularly at BCIT, where it launched back in 2020. BC is reporting 379 new cases of COVID-19 and six new deaths today. There are currently 224 people in hospital. Of those, 77 are in intensive care. Nearly 86% of eligible people five and older in BC have received their first dose of COVID-19 and 12% have gotten a third dose. And Ontario is set to send antigen tests home with its 2.2 million students for the winter holidays. But will BC follow suit? We posed that question today to Dr. Henry, and the short answer is no. But she did seem to leave the door open for some situations. I would like to see some of the at-home tests be available for people um, for those times when um, your child is sick uh, and you're not sure whether they should, uh, whether it's COVID or not, and, and uh, an at-home test can help you. And if it's positive, then you can go for the more accurate PCR test. Uh, there is one thing she is changing, and it's good news for festive frolics. Business holiday events with more than 50 vaccinated people will now be allowed with some conditions. The Tourism Association of BC has negotiated a return of standing events just in time for the holiday. That means they don't have to have the seating requirement imposed for concerts, funerals, weddings and theatre. But the order maintains a ban on dancing at all events unless it's part of a performance. After being stranded in South Africa, our national women's junior field hockey team is scheduled to arrive home tomorrow. Now, this includes 14 of 20 players from B.C. New restrictions with the Omicron variant means flights from many African countries have been banned. Canadians can come home, but they have to fly to another country for a third-party test first, and this team is exempt from that. Sue Goddard is a parent of two teens on the team and joins me now. Oh, thank you. How are you feeling about this news? Oh my God, I'm excited about them coming. I'm very excited. I keep going on on the uh, website to track where the plane is. Right now, it's about three hours away from Frankfurt. I'm, I'll feel very relieved when they're there and on the flights to Canada. No kidding. So did you have any moments of, any real big moments of panic that you, you know, they may be stuck there for a long time? Yeah, I'd say about three days in when we realized that it wasn't easy to get flights rebooked. And then when we found out that this third country testing was in place and there wasn't a way for them to actually clear that in Germany and come to Canada. So that all the regulations that were in place were stopping that from happening for, for them and from anyone else flying from South Africa. So at that point, it was feeling a little... Uh, we weren't sure what our options were, and we were, think we were all getting a little panicky that it was going to be a charter or, or maybe Christmas in South Africa. And what has it been like for your daughters in South Africa this whole time? On the field, they've been supported by their coaches and their manager. That has been fantastic. We felt very safe with where they were. The hotel they were at was on the university campus, and they were literally about 200 meters from the field. So they were able to keep training. They, they're all university students, so they kept studying, writing papers, 
getting ready for finals. Um, they had a bit of time to rest in between. So they kind of turned it into a, a training camp with a lot of school time. So I was really proud of their resilience around that, but it was, um, there was certainly some big ups and downs. The biggest down was for sure when they found that the World Cup was canceled, they, they won a ticket, they punched their ticket to come to the games when they won gold at the Pan Ams, which no Canadian team has done before at any level. So going from that high in August to getting to South Africa, getting there early, getting ready for the World Cup, and then having that all taken away was probably their low. And then there were some peaks and valleys through that as they sort of struggled to find out how they were going to get home. Yeah, tumultuous journey for sure. Hopefully they get another shot at it. Sue Goddard is a parent of two teens on the Canadian Junior Women's Field Hockey Team. Thank you. Thank you. So will the vaccines work? More research is saying, well, maybe. After the break, we look at how COVID vaccines match up to the Omicron variant. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. The boardwalk on the Halifax waterfront is back to being fully open. The public space of the multi-million and multi-year Queen's Mark is being applauded for its public art. And as Colleen Jones reports, for its unique access to the harbour. The newest addition to the Halifax waterfront is this, the Queen's Mark project and the showpiece of the whole thing, public access. The jewel of it all, the stairway, not to heaven, but the harbor. Francesca Mayaki couldn't resist dipping her toe from the harbor stairs into the chilly waters. Oh my goodness, it's so cold. But do you love doing that? I do, I do. Everyone wants a snap of this unique exterior architectural feature. I think it looks good, especially um, in the summertime. I believe it will be a wonderful place to come and chill and relax. As her husband Roy takes a photo, his wife Joanna Galloway is at the water's edge. You think it's gorgeous? I think it's the, the incredible public space. This was a parking lot for 200 cars and now it's a 100,000 square feet of new public space. That's Jennifer Angel from Develop Nova Scotia. This project has taken years to complete and has cost millions of dollars. The boardwalk has reopened now and this section called Rise Again is still to be completed. That will likely happen in the spring. There's a lot of exterior public art. This installation called The Siren Calling by local artist John Greer and this piece called The Sail by Italian sculptor Eduardo Turoldi. But it's these steps that are drawing people in. All public space, we're excited to see how people do use it. I mean, we've had people talk about the polar bear swim. Uh, we've heard people talking about launching kayaks, uh, fishing, uh, dipping their toes in the water. I think there'll be all sorts of interesting uses. And then you freeze. What? Well, she did say polar bear swim. So let me be one of the first to take the plunge with Sabrina McKean, just out walking her dog, helping me zip up my wetsuit and encouraging me to swim further than I want to. Ah, uh, she's going to Dartmouth. <laughs> Well, I might not get to Dartmouth, but I can tell you, the best view of this place is in here. Never thought I would be doing that. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Halifax.
Omicron variant is spreading around the world and across this country, and with it, worry is growing too. Now, one of the key questions is whether the vaccines we already have are effective against this variant's mutations. And on that, today there is progress. Christine Birak with how one drug maker says its shot holds up. Scientists say it's clear. Our immune defenses against Omicron are dropping. The question is, how much protection do vaccines still offer us? Pfizer is now saying two shots are good, three are better. Well, These are very good news. In a press release, the drug maker says preliminary lab studies demonstrate that three doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine neutralize the Omicron variant, adding two doses may still induce protection against severe disease. Still, the company's CEO says he's not ruling out a brand new shot. The current booster will be enough to maintain protection. But if we need one, I'm sure we can make one. And the good news is that we will have it by March. What we really need now is a coordinated research effort and not jumping to conclusions on, you know, study by study. The World Health Organization warns only a few studies have been done so far. All of them have only looked at how well one part of the immune system neutralizing antibodies attack Omicron. But there are other parts of the immune system that can still shut this variant down. I think it's premature to conclude that this reduction in utilizing activity would result in a significant reduction in vaccine effectiveness. We do not know that. The WHO says anyone who hasn't been vaccinated needs a shot, but isn't convinced third doses or boosters are needed yet. I understand the skepticism about seeing a data that comes from the drug company. Even if our current vaccines are effective, many experts insist immunity wanes. Another shot can slow the spread of this variant and better protect older adults. What we know so far is enough to raise our level of concern to the point where we should start considering those third doses for people who are eligible. That's the CBC's Christine Birak tonight in Toronto. Now, the Omicron variant is set to become the dominant COVID strain in the United Kingdom by Christmas. As Chris Brown tells us, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is trying to enact new restrictions to combat the surge, but his government is facing a credibility crisis thanks to a recently surfaced video. The optics are horrible for Boris Johnson, trying to fend off a surging new COVID variant in the midst of a crisis of public confidence. I can understand how infuriating it must be to think that the people who have been setting the rules have not been following the rules. I apologise unreservedly. His fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> A leaked video filmed a year ago appears to show Downing Street staffers at a mock news conference <laughs> laughing about holding a Christmas gathering when just about everyone else in Britain was locked down. What's the answer? I don't know. I didn't the party was cheese and wine. <laughs> Johnson <laughs> continues to deny there was a party, but the video suggests otherwise. Millions of people now think the Prime Minister was taking them for fools yeah, yeah. and that they were lied to. Yeah, yeah. They're right, aren't they? Can you stop, please? Allegra stop. Stratton, the staffer at the centre of the controversy, country, resigned in tears outside of her home. I will regret those remarks for the rest of my days. This isn't just about Johnson's government looking bad, though. The concern is that fury over the apparent double standard could undermine efforts to fight the Omicron variant. In England, it's estimated that Omicron is doubling every two to three days. Christina Poggle says though Omicron is poised to become the dominant COVID variant by Christmas, she believes Britons will continue to behave responsibly. And I kind of tend to think, to be honest, that the people are better than their leaders. And that, you know, you have to emphasise that you do these things for each other and not because you're told to. Still, at this London pharmacy where people were getting booster shots, anger over the alleged Christmas party was evident. I think it's massively hypocritical. I think it's really rich for the government to give us rules that we have to follow and they're not following them themselves. I see it honestly as a bit of a betrayal. But from Monday, you should work from home if you can. Tonight, from the same Downing Street studio where that can, mock right? news conference was filmed, Boris Johnson so, announced uh, new restrictions, including working from home again, as he tried to push past the crisis. Chris Brown, CBC News, London.
And the head of Instagram faced tough questions at a U.S. Senate hearing today. The popular photo sharing app, along with its parent company, Meta Platforms, formerly Facebook, have recently come under intense scrutiny. As Julia Wong reports, it has to do with their services and how they affect the mental health of youth. Our nation is in the midst of a teen mental health crisis. U.S. Senators grilled Instagram CEO Adam Mosuri today about how the app impacts teen mental health and body image. And do you think three hours a day is an appropriate amount of time for kids to spend on Instagram? One of the biggest concerns, apparent lack of action on the part of the social media giant, even after issues were flagged to it. There is such a frustration that you turn a blind eye toward taking responsibility and accepting accountability for your platform, how you are structured. We need to make sure that the responsibility is on big tech to put a safe product on the market. Mosuri, at times defensive, talked about how he saw the app as a positive force. And I'm proud that our platform is a place where they can spend time with the people that they care about, where they can start incredible movements, the Senate grilling comes months after a former Facebook employee testified that Facebook, now called Meta Platforms, which owns Instagram, puts profits before people. Teens are often transfixed by the app. Frances Haugen also said the company was aware of research suggesting it contributes to mental health and body image issues. But today, Mosuri downplayed those concerns. Respectfully, I don't believe the research suggests that our products are addictive. We can debate the meaning of the word addictive. But the fact is that teens who go to the platform find it difficult, maybe sometimes impossible, to stop. Instagram unveiled new features Tuesday, which it says will help keep teens safe. But for some, it's too little too late. Should have, they could have been announced years ago. They weren't, and in fact, these changes fall way short of what we need, in my view. Mosuri also testified that their plans for Instagram Kids has been paused, but stopped short of saying the program has been scrapped completely. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. A Calgary man has pleaded guilty to manslaughter in the death of a city police officer almost one year ago. 20-year-old Amir Abdul Rahman has been charged with first-degree murder in the hit-and-run death of Sergeant Andrew Harnett. Abdul Rahman was a passenger in an SUV that fled during a traffic stop. Officers had stopped the vehicle because the headlights were on. As Hernet was issuing tickets, the vehicle sped away, dragging him and throwing him into oncoming traffic. Abdul Rahman was wanted on several outstanding warrants at the time. He took control of the steering wheel at least twice during the escape. The other man in the car, the alleged driver, is also charged with first-degree murder. He is set for trial at the end of next month and cannot be identified under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Well, CBC News has learned that protecting Prince Harry and his family during visits to Canada has cost taxpayers more than $334,000 over a period of less than four years. The records were obtained from the RCMP through the Access to Information Act. Security related to Harry's visits between April 2017 and March of 2018 cost about $182,000. The money covered things like overtime and travel costs, but not the salaries of police officers. That period included a week-long trip to Toronto for a Wee Day celebration and a reception for the Duke of Edinburgh Gold Awards. And Canada has decided to join the United States, the UK and Australia in a diplomatic boycott of the upcoming Winter Olympics in China. As David Cochran reports, the common reason is to protest China's human rights record. It's China's first opportunity to host the world since the 2008 Summer Olympics. But now Canada joins a growing list of countries that won't be showing up. We will not be sending any diplomatic representation to the Beijing Olympic or Paralympic Games this winter. The athletes will still go, the politicians and diplomats will not. Matching what the U.S. announced on Monday and other allies today. There will be effectively a, a diplomatic boycott uh, of the Winter Olympics in Beijing. No ministers are expected to attend and no officials, Mr. Speaker. The Australian government will not be sending any uh, official representatives uh, to the 
forthcoming Winter Games. The common reason is to protest China's human rights record. Clearly, it is important for us to send a strong signal to China uh, because we're extremely concerned with what is going on in terms of human rights allegations regarding uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. China's foreign ministry dismissed it as political grandstanding, saying the politicians and diplomats weren't invited in the first place. It's been very clear uh, that concerns around arbitrary detention are real. But this is not just a matter of principle for Canada. The arbitrary detention of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver has made it deeply personal and put a spotlight on concerns for the security of Canadian athletes. There's already agents that have been hired to ensure the security of the athletes and we're still in discussion with the RCMP. The Canadian Olympic and Paralympic committees issued a statement saying they respect the government's decision but say that letting the athletes compete is the right move, arguing that athlete boycotts only hurt athletes and don't create meaningful change. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. It's a small mountain village with a big problem, housing, specifically the lack of it. The crunch facing Fernie next. One of the fastest runners the world has ever known is dead at the age of 42. Harry Jerome, a sprinter, died in Vancouver yesterday after suffering a brain seizure. Sheldon Turcott has prepared this report on Jerome's career. And they're off and running. Harry Jerome rocketed to world attention in this race in Saskatoon on July 15, 1960. He ran the 100 meters in 10 seconds flat, a world record that stood for eight years. But in the Olympics that same year, Jerome pulled up lame and was severely criticized at home. Canadians expected him to win and blamed his loss on an attitude problem. When he pulled up lame again at the Commonwealth Games in 1962, he was called a quitter. But Harry Jerome proved he was anything but a quitter. He continued to train and run and made an amazing comeback. He won the bronze medal in the 64 Tokyo Olympics for the 100 meters. He won a gold medal at the Commonwealth Games the same year. In 1966, he set a world record of 9.1 seconds in the 100-yard dash. And in 1967, at the age of 27, when most sprinters are over the hill, Jerome swept a victory in the Pan American Games. His gold medal time for the 100 meters was 10.2 seconds. Jerome, who held a master's degree in physical education, remained active in amateur athletics for the rest of his life. He had set world records and captured many medals over the years, but his proudest award was the Order of Canada, presented in 1970 by Governor General Roland Michener for Harry Jerome's outstanding efforts on and off the field. Sheldon Turcott, CBC News. Talk of gun control legislation was not the topic of conversation around the world today. Millions of people were just too stunned by the news of Lenin's sudden death. Sheldon Turcott has more. Word of the shooting spread like wildfire to the night people in cities across North America. They maintained lonely vigils throughout the long night. And everywhere it was the same, shock and disbelief. I still cannot believe it. It's, it's really bad. No, this can't happen. One of the Beatles doesn't die. <laughs> yeah. No way. Imagine there's no heaven. Everywhere, radio stations were swamped with calls from heartbroken and distraught fans. My mother called me and says that. Been shot, and I, <laughs> I didn't believe her. No. And my friend called uh, ten minutes later. She says he's dead. And after that, I don't know. I just feel so sick. I feel like I've lost something. You know. Who well, grew up with John Lennon? Uh, people who uh, weren't even born when the Beatles uh, came out with their music in the early '60s, and the, the reaction is one of shock, grief, uh, a lot of reaction. People very mad. Uh, that John Lennon is no longer with us. Within hours of opening this morning, record stores were sold out of Beatles and Lennon music. The distributor of John Lennon's latest album, Double Fantasy, says he's already received orders for 200,000 copies across Canada.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's been a little bit chaotic. There's concern about dangerous driving on the only open route for freight trucks connecting the Lower Mainland with the rest of Canada. There's been an increase in crashes along Highway 3, and it's a route heavily relied upon right now to keep the supply chain going with the Coquihalla closed. Police have even increased enforcement to keep people safe. There's been a 49% increase in abuse and neglect of older adults in BC, according to the province's seniors advocate. Her report finds there's actually significant underreporting of incidents as well, and it's calling on a better system to track these incidents. A Saanich High School student hit by a vehicle in a marked crosswalk on Monday has died. They were taken to Victoria General Hospital with life-threatening injuries, but died this morning. The driver of the vehicle is cooperating with the investigation. Well, ski season has just started, but some seasonal workers in Fernie are still living rough. They say a lack of available housing means they're struggling to put a roof over their heads. Oh, <laughs> I've been here for two, almost three weeks. So yeah, three weeks of sleeping in my car so far, in Fernie. Uh, maybe uh, till the end of November, I think it will be fine. I'm not gonna freeze to death in November, but uh, the temperature kind of changed drastically sometimes, so that's what it scares me sometimes. Finding affordable housing and, and rental inventory is a huge challenge for our community. It's impacting many businesses. The cost of living in Fernie is rising every year, um, including the cost of housing. And, and so, you know, some of these minimum wage folks are really just starting to be priced out of the market. That's what we were starting to see. I share those frustrations and they're, they're hard to hear. They're devastating. Um, I grew up here. This is my hometown. Will my children be able to afford to live here? Probably not. In 2021, the price of a single family, the average price of a single family home has jumped to 796,000. So that's almost what, 16, 17% increase in the average price of the home just in, just in the one year. Uh, I think a lot of people took advantage of the seller's market and sold their homes. And a lot of these homes that were being sold were homes that were used for rentals. So yeah, I think it's put a massive squeeze on the rental market. Fernie right now is an incredibly attractive place to live. We're a beautiful mountain community, so there's so many reasons that people are moving to Fernie um, for recreation, for employment, for investment and retirement, and that's just adding so much pressure to our housing market. I need like a, <laughs> just a simple bed and a shower. 500 is my range, I guess, 500, six. I can maybe go for seven, but beyond that is just, what's the purpose of working and just spending all, all on rent, you know? It's definitely too expensive for a guy like me with a minimum wage job <laughs> kind of thing. I know of a bunch of businesses across town of all different sectors that have made job offers to folks from outside the community and, and wanted to attract that talent into their organization. And then that person's ended up turning down the job because they simply just couldn't find themselves a place to live in Fanny. So it's having a huge impact on businesses and across all sectors and all pay levels, really. I think sometimes businesses need to have a real direct economic impact before they spend money to find their own solution. And I know um, this year in particular, it's been such a challenge for our community that there's a lot of people talking about workforce housing. To move the needle on that issue, we really need everybody working together. So we need the ski resort needs to be at the table, we need the City of Fernie at the table and their planning department. Obviously all the businesses in town, you know, other agencies like the Fernie Chamber and Tourism Fernie. Um, as well as provincial and federal governments. I think there just needs to be more units built across the board, whether it's attainable housing, multi-family units, single-family homes. The best way out of this problem is to build and build more of what we need. I'm definitely optimistic, yeah. Got to stay positive. I think I'll find something. I'm beginning to make new friends and know the town more, so I think I'll do some, uh, I'll find something, but it's not going to be uh, what I was hoping for, definitely. But. You know. Act like a man, don't be a sissy. A new project is trying to change the channel on masculine messaging with music. That's next. 
At 643, you're looking at a live shot of snowy Revelstoke tonight. Snow down low and also up high. Johanna has your full winter forecast coming up. We always believed in Hayloft so very much and it never really got its chance to be seen or heard or felt. At that time, the industry, it wasn't set up to expose quirky songs like that. So I guess here we are now when things are a bit more anarchistic and freeform and there's less rules and there's less gatekeeping. Now is a much better time for this song to be enjoyed by a large group of people than then. Well, I mean, the first thing you got to understand about Hayloft is that on the record and at the time when it was released, Hayloft was a bit of an outlier. I do remember very distinctly, Hayloft was kind of like not really a song that anybody thought, you know, there was even some argument that it should maybe not even be on the record because it was just too weird. I mean, I wanted the first song on Oh My Heart to be Hayloft. I wanted the first single to be Hayloft. I wanted the whole campaign to launch with Hayloft. We start at the top here, you know, the track starts out was all about the riff. That's the big riff that everybody always hears. There's something visceral about a good riff that people really connect to. Yeah, more, the world needs more riffs. Less, less words, less talking, less singing, more riffing. There's not really a ton of lyrical content in this song. It's just kind of fun. It was just sort of playing with words and, and just following the spirit, but there was no real kind of like, I want to write a song about this. Yeah, it was my daddy's got a gun. It was like, okay, what does that mean? And then it's, it just becomes kind of fun. It's like, oh, what, what story could you pull from that sentiment? It could have been a, about anything if it had the right phonetics. The way the song is structured is like these Lego bricks of fierce energy. With guitar and then kind of barking vocals and then double time and then half time and then like a semitone key change and then back to the riff. There's a thousand kids who cover it in various ways on TikTok. I think, you know, we, there's, a, there's a permission that has been granted. It's funny, a permission that you realize you never needed. You always had permission to make the music exactly how you wanted to make it. But, you know, sometimes it takes this, a, a TikTok phenomenon with a song like Hayloft that doesn't have lyrics until 45 seconds to blow up, to remind you that you're allowed to just do whatever you want. In the year 2050, how will BC look? From agriculture to cities, how will climate change change life? Don't miss 2050 Degrees of Change, a CBC Vancouver original podcast, now available. Well, it's a holiday village scene made entirely out of Lego. Kelowna's Jason Pettyjohn has spent 11 years collecting and building this Christmas Lego scene. The village now stands at 25,000 bricks and gets rebuilt every year. Now it's become a family tradition. Jason's still got plenty of unused bricks and is still thinking of ways of expanding his set. And he's not ready to let go of the idea. And meteorologist and staff is here. <laughs> Joe, uh, Wesley's probably a little too young still, right, to be into the Lego? Anita, just in the past couple of weeks, his Lego interest has uh. exploded. Yes, yeah, so uh, better put a word in with a certain St. Nick about uh, getting some Lego stat over the next couple of weeks. No kidding. Uh, I, hear, I hear it lasts uh, quite a long, quite a number of years as well. So Yes, yes, as long as you don't step on it and uh, make sure it's put away. <laughs> 
play at the end of each play. Yeah. So yeah, let's see what we can do. We got a few weeks ahead. Uh, wintry scenes, though, definitely something that uh, the local mountains are thinking of as we head into a cold air mass, as I mentioned earlier. It's chilly out here tonight. Those northwesterly winds will be dropping temperatures even farther tomorrow. Let me show you what we've got going on out there right now with the current temperatures. Uh, four for YVR, zeros across the uh, strait in Nanaimo, two out towards Abbotsford. Uh, so it's a chilly Thursday morning. The northwesterly winds are keeping our temperatures down tomorrow. It'll be a good two to three degrees cooler for your Thursday. I think we'll see some sunshine, but watch for some showers in the morning and the evening. So sort of bookended by that risk across the south coast. Just wanted to show you the snowfall forecast through the next 24 hours. I think this might be overplaying it. You can see Chilliwack there and a little bit of a, a 10 centimeter bullseye. Uh, generally five to 10 centimeters, I think above sort of 1,000 meters, but that snow level is dropping for Friday into Saturday to about 500 meters at this point. And we do have that special weather statement in place for the South Coast for uh, a bit of a storm Friday and Saturday, rain, snow, and high winds across the South Coast. We'll sort of uh, tease that out for tomorrow once we get the latest model update. Uh, so starting you Thursday morning, this is just great precip. Wanted to show you this general northwesterly flow, and that's where our next system is coming from, straight down the Northwest Coast. Uh, we'll continue to see uh, temperatures uh, stay on the cool side until Friday, and that's when uh, we'll get a bit of a warm-up, and that's showing up in our long-range forecast nine for Saturday uh, as we get into that uh, uh, warm front push before cooling back down on Sunday. Uh, but taking you day by day, watching for that sunshine midday tomorrow. It'll feel a lot cooler, and be prepared. You might get hit by showers on either end. Down to a two tomorrow night, and then back up to a seven for Friday as that Pacific system rolls in. Uh, it, it's going to be a rain event at this point for Metro Vancouver, but above 500 meters, a snow event and winds for all. We may see some sun on the back end of that system Saturday afternoon. Not ruling out some sunny breaks on Sunday either, but I've got to keep the showers in there for now. Uh, it's four spit spots at this point. Uh, just have to get through the Friday-Saturday storm. Something for everyone, this forecast. I guess that's good. Everyone's going to be happy. <laughs> Yeah, somebody somewhere is going to be happy with this. <laughs> the glass is always half full. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Okay, there's a new project in the works in Toronto, and its aim is big. You've heard words like, suck it up, princess, real men don't cry. Words used to, quote, strengthen boys from a young age. But as Ali Shayson is looking at a new campaign, it's using music as a tool to help men unlearn the societal norm that showing emotion is weak. Music can move you physically, but when the right song hits at the right time, it moves you emotionally. That power of music is being tapped into in a new awareness campaign called Uncomposed. Music definitely has the power to unlock our emotions, to help us to process it. The music you're hearing is an original score written to evoke emotion. That's when we engaged with musicians. That's when we said, we want to compose this piece. We engaged the Canadian Opera Company and, and they helped us throughout this process of composing this beautiful, touching piece that was created just for, for men to, to get started on, on this conversation. White Ribbon Canada engages men and boys in the prevention of gender-based violence. And this is an exercise in unlearning the societal norm that emotions equal weakness. We've come to realize that, that if we don't challenge this, this aspect of, of not being vulnerable, then men are not going to be able to create healthy relationships that are based on with communication skills, uh, displaying your emotions and showing yourself as you truly are. The idea of a man showing vulnerability is difficult to do because it's not accepted. As soon as that uh, cello hit, I remember distinctly this feeling of this big weight just kind of coming down on me, this emotional weight, and it was totally un unexpected. And uh, it was, and that was it. <laughs> I started to reflect about, you know, my my job as a dad. You know, what newly newly uh, uh, separated, so you know all the responsibilities that come with being a parent. I guess the music just allowed me an opportunity to reflect on things in a kind of a safer way. And as a guy, you don't really let your, your feelings show that way too often. So it was it was a really, really unique and vulnerable experience. And it really helped me reevaluate 
what is strength in being a man and as a guy in 2021. And what did your boys think? First, my oldest, he was 11. He kind of smirked about it. And you could tell he had that defensive posture about it. But my youngest said, it's okay, dad. My youngest was a little guy. And he said, he said, it's okay, dad, that you cried. I, I cry sometimes too. And it was a really, it was a really cool experience, you know? And it, it, again, it was a conversation I don't think I would have been able to have had without this experience. Wow. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Just in time for the holidays, five harbor seals were sent back into the ocean today. The sights and sounds from Iona Beach coming up. Busy Tizzy loves her odd socks. They are her favorite pair, but she sometimes gets in trouble because she wears them everywhere. We just released Busy Tizzy's Odd Socks. Uh, Kevin and Jessica did the illustrations for that one as well, and it's absolutely fabulous. Kids are loving it. Kids love the first book so much. I've sold almost 2,500 copies of the first book, and to date, uh, in three, little over three weeks, I've sold almost 700 copies of the second book. Busy Tizzy wore them to karate class, where she's a pro at breaking bricks. I wrote this book almost 20 years ago. So it sat that long. I actually dreamt this story. A very, very long time ago, woke up in the morning and I remembered this dream. And it said, in my dream, you should write a story about what children want to be when they grow up using each letter of the alphabet. So I think it took me two nights and I wrote the book. And I, at the time, I had sent it to several uh, publishers, but it wasn't illustrated, so it didn't go any further than that. And then it just basically sat for all those years. I needed to do something different uh, with my life and my career, and I decided that finally, after all this time, I was going to blow the dust off this manuscript that sat in the basement and um, seriously find an illustrator, and I did. Luckily, I found Kevin and Jessica, and they brought Busy Tizzy to life. I always like to take on a, what I consider a project. So I do my regular work, which is, you know, illustrations and it, cartoons, editorial cartoons for the Telegram and that. And so this was a real fun project that I, you know, that I said, OK, I'll get involved in. And it was during the pandemic. So I was able to, uh, the process is to do thumbnails and design the book and then do the illustration, get uh, uh, bounce it off Yvonne, and then, then my daughter and I work on it. And uh, it was a slow period, and so I was able to have it drawn and illustrated and in with her in about two, three-month period. This year for the second book, that was more of a six-month period, you know, just, just the, the concept conceptually and the illustration. So my mother used to say, I, I'm very nosy. Uh, I was very nosy, and so I'm always looking, always taking pictures, always using them as reference for my editorial cartoons. And I have, you know, a two-year-old granddaughter who, you know, if I show you my phone, the pictures I got of her, which I'm sure as any proud grandparent. But I do a lot of, the, I copy the mannerisms and, the, you know, use it as reference for the illustration. So it's, it's about being, just keep your mind, you know, keep your eyes and your ears, everything open, and, uh, and just keep getting influenced by, you know, what's on the go, right? So...
Vancouver Aquarium Marine Mammal Rescue Centre is sending animals home for the holidays. Five harbour seals were sent back into their natural habitat today. And in that pack was Scrambled Egg, a pup who was rescued. And she was with the rescue centre for 177 days healing an eye injury. All of the five rescued seals came to the centre at a very young age after being separated from their mothers. Centre volunteers fed the pups bottled milk, taught them how to swim, and even how to catch fish. We, these five harbour seals all came from the British Columbia coastline. Um, the, we have a variety of, of animals that come through our program, uh, but these five actually came in uh, near the uh, end of August. So they've been with us for a few months. They're all quite special to us. The Marine Mammal Rescue Centre rescues, rehabilitates and releases more than 150 marine animals each year. Okay, a Saskatchewan homeowner's display of Christmas lights has earned him the nickname Clark Griswold, and neighbours realized they couldn't compete, so they came up with an easier solution. A big ditto sign pointed to our neighbours saying that we can't keep up with them, but we want to join in on the fun. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the house in question is decorated with some 15,000 Christmas lights this year. In addition to the light display, they also project a different Christmas movie onto the house each night for kids and kids at heart to watch. And in the giving spirit, uh, he encourages people who come by for a look to donate to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. We have some pretty spectacular Christmas displays around BC as well. Uh, there's one on Burn Lake Road in Burnaby that I went to the other night, and it really is something to see. So if you have some time this weekend, perhaps go check it out. That's it for our show tonight. Dan will be here tomorrow evening, and I will see you on Monday. Good night.